Welcome to your first video of the musculoskeletal system block of Anatomy 403. My name is Mary Orchikowski and I go by Dr. O and I'm excited to work with you. So if you haven't listened to the introduction videos already, I would recommend looking at those first just to have an idea of what to expect. In this first day, we're going to discuss the skeletal system and we'll start here with an introduction. What I would like you to be able to do after this video is to summarize the functions of the skeletal system, distinguish axial and appendicular skeletons, distinguish compact and spongy bone, differentiate the five categories of bones, and diagram the parts of a long bone. Before we get into it, I'd like you to take a moment to pause the video and write out what comes to mind when you think of the functions of the skeletal system. When you're ready, let's talk about some of these. So one of the first things you might have thought about is that the skeletal system is a skeleton or a framework for the body. And this provides it structure and support. It also enables movement, like we can see over here. We'll come back to this when we talk about the joints and the muscles as well. Now what about the function in this region right here. We see that the rib cage of the thoracic wall is surrounding these organs deep to here, like the lungs, the heart, and some of those gastrointestinal or the digestive system organs. So this allows for protection of these general cavities that are containing these structures. So protection of the cranial cavity, thoracic, abdominal, pelvic, and so on. In other functions, within bone, and specifically within the bone marrow, red and white blood cells are made. And deep within hollow portions of the bone, like this medullary cavity we see here, this is an important point for storage of adipocytes or fat cells. Finally, bones are so important in terms of minerals. We need to drink your milk to have strong bones, right? Well, maybe not exactly, but mineral balance is imperative to normal body functioning, and bone contains some of the highest concentrations of these minerals, like calcium and phosphate, in the whole body. Now, structurally and functionally, the skeleton is divided into axial and appendicular skeletons. The axial skeleton is this central portion right along the central axis of the body. This is made up of the skull, the ribs, the vertebrae, and these protect the organs that keep us alive. The appendicular skeleton forms the limbs and enables us to walk and interact with the world. So we see here the upper limb, and down here, the lower limb. When we take a coronal or a frontal section of a femur, which is the thigh bone, we can see that there are two different organizations of bone tissue inside. One is more spacious, like what we see up here, and one is more dense, like this portion there. In all bones, there's a layer of compact bone, the dense layer, surrounding the spongy bone, which is the porous layer. So while compact bone is stronger, spongy bone is a different kind of strong. In some bones, the spongy bone will surround a hollow space called the medullary cavity, like the one we can see here. We'll talk more about the organization of the tissue and the contents of the medullary cavity in future videos. Anatomists and biologists in general love to categorize things, and we have these categories to make larger assumptions about a group of structures rather than approaching each one as a brand new structure. So let's start with the five types of bones, long, short, sesamoid, flat, and irregular. So the first bone, a long bone, is typically what you think of when you think of a bone, something you might see around, around Halloween, and this is a shaft with little knobs on the ends. So these bones are found in our limbs. And one thing I want to review is, do you remember what proximal and distal mean? 
one of them is here and the other here. So proximal is closer to the attachment of a limb and distal is further from that attachment. So fingers are much more distal than the shoulder. Now long bones have named regions. On the extreme ends of the bones, we find the epiphyses, one on either end. Then the shaft is known as the diaphysis and the space in between the epiphysis and the diaphysis is known as the metaphysis. This is a transitional zone. So these terms will be really helpful for us when we're looking at the bone under a microscope, and it's helpful to know what we're looking for. The next are these square-shaped bones, generally quite small and found in our wrists and in our ankles. These are called short bones. You can see in a cross section a nice thin layer of compact bone here surrounding the more porous spongy bone deep to it. Sesamoid bones develop in tendons, specifically those that experience a lot of friction. So it's a huge group of muscles that crosses the knee in the front of your thigh. So these muscles shown in this image here are the quadriceps, the quads. And within the tendon of the quads, we find the patella. So this patella is a floating bone. It doesn't articulate with another and it develops directly in a tendon. Another example of this that almost all of us have is the pisiform. And that's found within the tendon of one of our flexors of the wrist. So sesamoid bones may or may not develop elsewhere. So how many bones do we have in our body? We usually say 206, but everyone is special. So flat bones have more of a plate-like structure. They're broad and thin and can have curvature to them, like those of the skull. So flat bones have two plates of compact bone, this level here and that layer here, surrounding this inner core or inner layer of spongy bone that's sort of sandwiched in the middle. This flat bone we can see rotating here is the parietal bone, one of the large bones of the skull. So the vertebrae and some bones of our face defy categories, so they're in their own irregular category. However, we do see that in this case with a cross section of a vertebrae that the outer compact bone and inner spongy bone persists. So let's take a look at our first question. Which type of bones make up the majority of the axial skeleton? How about the appendicular skeleton? You wanna choose all that apply. So pause your video so you can write down what you think and then we'll talk about it. So when you're ready, let's start with the axial skeleton. You'll remember that this is the one outlined here in purple, and it's right along the midline of the body surrounding cavities. So we can see bones of the skull and also bones of the rib cage or the thoracic wall are flat bones. And these will form a protective shell around the internal structures like the brain and the viscera in the thoracic cavity. What other bones do we see in this region? So if we look from below, we see running right along this axis are these vertebrae and those are all irregular shaped bones. Now the appendicular skeleton relates to the appendages or the limbs and most of the bones in this region are like this one here, which are long bones. So that bone there is the humerus. We also see short bones in the wrist and the ankle, 
And finally, sesamoid bones are found in areas of high friction, and we have way more of that in the limbs. So this is a general idea here of which make up the majority, but keep in mind that the scapula here and the hip bone here are the point where the limb meets with the trunk, and both of those bones are flat bones. So there are flat bones as well as a part of the appendicular skeleton, more so as they are transitioning toward the trunk. As you're studying the bones for the course, take a moment to think about which category each fits within, based on its characteristics and its shape. So as I can and as it's relevant, I will share Awkward Yeti comics with you. The artist of this is actually local, out of Northville, and I like this specific comic because it's a reminder of bone being more than a framework. It's actually a dynamic structure. However, this little green guy here is the gallbladder and he is my favorite, and you see that he has made stones. So looking through these comics is a really great study break, if I do say so myself. So thanks for joining me in this video and I'll see you in the next one.